Thank you, Drew, and good afternoon to all of you. Welcome to all the guests we have here with us today. Thank you, Barana, for that special music. I know you had a hard time getting here and way behind times and then all the little glitches. Uh, let everybody know that those of you who are guests here with us today, we've got people from all over the world, I guess, visiting us. That's really nice. If you want to stay afterwards, you're sure welcome to. We've got plenty of food and plenty of room. We'd love to have you. And then also for everybody else, we have this photo booth up here. And what I would like to do is get a picture of every family in the church who's ever here today. And every couple in the church, I'd like a picture of them. And then all the singles, I'd like to get individual shots of singles or couples together, two or three people to get together, that sort of thing. Because we want all these pictures for the scrapbook that we're going to be putting together for the congregation. So it's not just because of the Western night. That's part of it. But we figured we'd get an opportunity to get a picture of everybody. So anyway. Hopefully, you all, we got quite a few out of the way before services, uh, and we can do some more after the Bible study today. And if our guests would like pictures of yourselves, I'll take pictures of you, and you can give me your email address, I'll send them to you. They all turned out really cute, too, with this uh, prop that uh, Dirk and Kathy put together. Well, I hope you all had a really enjoyable week and enjoyed the rain that we had last weekend and then the rain that started again yesterday. We had about 18 or 19 straight hours of rain at our place yesterday, which was really nice. And it seems that there's a storm after storm after storm lined up for the next about 10 days or so. They're predicting snow in the mountains for the next 10 straight days, which is really, really great news. So we're all, all of our prayers are finally being answered, and I just hope God keeps bringing the rain and the snow that we so desperately need here. Have you ever noticed that there are times in our lives when it just seems like Satan is probably getting the best of us? Sometimes it's a little hard to maintain our faith or maybe even our trust in God when everything and many things in our lives just seem to be going against us. Maybe it's when we're in the middle of one of those greatest battles of our life, maybe a life-threatening battle or just really traumatic times that we're dealing with in our lives. You know, it's in those times that we need God and we need Jesus Christ more than ever before, yet it seems like when we get into situations like this, Talking to God and communicating with them is probably the last thing on our agenda. It is in those times, I believe, that our faith and our trust in God is really put to the test. God sees where we really stand when we're really going through tough times. That's where the rubber meets the road, so to speak, in our Christian walk. Good times, everything's good. It's easy to communicate with God. It's easy to pray to God. It's easy to be inspiring. It's easy to be uplifting and encouraging to other people. But when bad times hit, the whole reverse order takes place, and we start losing our perspective on anything. It's a whole lot easier to live as a Christian when things are going good, isn't it? I mean, you feel good. Life's going good. Things are going well with your job, family, work, every friends, and all that kind of stuff. But it's not so easy to do this when you feel like the whole weight of the world's on your shoulders. And sometimes... We as people, we as human beings, it doesn't matter who we are, whether we're in God's church or not, life just can get to be a heavy burden at times, and sometimes it can get just almost overwhelming. If our life is in the middle of any kind of turmoil and we have waves of temptation or frustration that we're about to be taken down, that's what we really need to stop, look up, realize that God and Jesus Christ are sitting up there on the throne in heaven, and ask them for help, ask them to intervene. This may be a moment that God is actually choosing to really put our faith to the test to see how we're going to react. We've learned in the last couple of sermons that it's not beyond God's reach to actually cause trauma in our lives. God says he disciplines us. God says he spanks us once in a while. He, he, he rebukes us once in a while. And it's for our own sake and our own good because he loves us so much he doesn't want us to get too far off track. When you think about it, that may be the very moment when the relationship with God and Jesus Christ will really come to life in our lives. God wants us to turn to him in every single aspect of our being. Good, bad, and maybe even when we're faltering or maybe giving into some kind of a weakness. That's when God really wants us to turn to him most. Turn with me, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Thought with all the clouds we had today, it'd be sort of dark in here, but it's really bright. <laughs> During World War II, there was a basic training camp in Florida. The daily training for those soldiers down in Florida 
included a long run through a really strenuous obstacle course. On the final stretch of this endurance course they were running, they had to grab this really long rope on one side of a pond that was about 25 feet out and really wide. They had to grab the rope and run and swing across the pool of water and get to the other side to complete the obstacle course. Well, under the blazing southern sun of Florida in the middle of summer, this water looked so inviting to the men that were in this training plane that what they would do is they would swing out to the middle of the water and just accidentally drop off and get cooled off in the pond. Well, that was until some enterprising lieutenant got a bright idea. The next night, he went out and he bought an alligator. He put the alligator in the pond and he fed it and the alligator stayed there. It was his new home. From that day on, when the recruits got to the end of the obstacle course run, they would grab that rope and run with unbelievable speed, hang on with unbelievable endurance, and land a good 10 feet beyond the pond. They had an engagement of encouragement to complete the course like never before. Likewise, our behavior as Christians must sometimes have a little bit of encouragement, if you will, of the danger or threat of something going wrong in our lives to keep us moving forward positively. And sometimes God will let things like this happen. As we heard last week, without God's loving correction and faithful discipline, we would never develop the spiritual strength and endurance that we need to make it to the end. If God didn't permit threatening conditions to come into our lives, we'd possibly fall prey to feelings of self-reliance and overconfidence, thinking that we've got it all put together. We can handle it. We don't need God. We don't need Jesus Christ. I don't need to be praying every single day. Okay, let's look at 1 Corinthians 10 and see Paul's continuing perspective on this subject of his troubles in his life. 1 Corinthians 10, let's begin in verse 1. Paul's writing here, he says, Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under a cloud, all passed through the sea. Paul's giving them a little bit of a history lesson now, but it's for a very good reason and a very good purpose. He goes on in verse 2, he said, All of those were baptized into Moses, into the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food. They all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. He's talking about all the events that took place when they were brought out of Egypt. Brought out of Egypt, taken out of slavery after over 400 years of tyranny. But then he goes on, verse 5. But with most of them, the ones that they brought out of Egypt after 400 years of captivity, but most of them, God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Their constant complaining was their demise, and God let them die before entering the promised land. They never could get themselves focused completely and totally on trusting and believing God's lead. And when we don't trust God, when we don't believe God, when we don't have the faith that God wants us to have, who do we trust? Who do we rely on? Us. We start relying on our judgment, our decision-making, our plans, our thinking, our reasoning, just like the ancient Israelites. The minute we start going down that path, the reason Paul wrote this in 1 Corinthians 10 is because the same thing that happened to them could happen to us. See, God has his limits to how much we can push him. He won't back away from us, but if we keep pushing hard enough and long enough, eventually he'll say, okay, you know, you just pushed yourself completely away from me. And I'm not going to give you a blessing when you're acting this way. Verse 6, now these things became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted, telling us that we can become so distracted in life if it doesn't go the way we want it to go. See, we have ideas, we have thoughts and directions in our lives. In other words, if our will, our personal will is not happening in our lives, that's when we can get it sidetracked. Then Paul goes on with his, his historical analogy, showing us the danger of wanting to impose our will 
upon our lives. Verse 7, he said, And do not become idolaters as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Nor let us commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in, 20, in one day, 3,000 fell. 23,000 fell. What's Paul, what's Paul done just right now? He said, when they imposed their will in life, and they didn't accept the will of God guiding and leading them and directing them, they became idolaters. They became sexually immoral. They became the way they were before God had ever started to work with them. See, we think sometimes as human beings that when we come out of the world, we come out of the way of thinking that God wants us to come out of, and we get baptized, and we get our hands laid on us, and we receive God's Holy Spirit, it's all hunky-dory, everything's good. But God wants us to take it from there and go forward. And the minute we start thinking everything is okay, it's not okay. That's when we can fall prey to the same thing they fell prey to. I mean, look at the drama of coming out of, Israel, or out of Egypt. When, when they were brought out of Egypt, there was something like two and a half, three million people, four million people. And they went against all the odds and all these miracles took place and all this drama took place. And they're all cheering for God and, you know, ranting and raving and thinking, oh, this is the greatest thing since sliced bread. And they're moving forward and all that. Two weeks later, three weeks later, four weeks later, it's all turned around. They go right back to where they were because things got a little bit tough in their lives. Things weren't going the way they wanted them to go. They were glad God took them out of slavery, but now they wanted to impose their will on their life and not accept God's will. Paul equates everything to our lives. He says, and he goes on in verse 9, he said, Nor let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by serpents. He said, I've, he, he said, I'm telling you, these things were written for our examples. They're not just interesting stories from the Old Testament. They're stories that God says, I want you to learn from the mistakes they made. Because if we can't learn from their mistakes, we are doomed to repeat those mistakes. And that's what Paul is trying to get us not to do. He said, nor, in verse 10, nor complain, as some of them also complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. So Paul's giving a litany of things in life that can start really dragging us down and pulling us further and further away from God. And we don't think anything of it, like I mentioned last week and the week before. You know, the first time we sin, the first time we do something we know we probably shouldn't do on the Sabbath, it's, it sort of eats at us. We get this real guilt complex inside. And then the second time we do it, we don't have quite the depth of the guilt and then the third time we do it, there's virtually no guilt. And by the time of the fourth or fifth time, it's just normal. We don't think anything of it. And we think it's perfectly fine. And that's that slippery slope that we can get ourselves on when we don't go back and start thinking about what it is God wants us to maintain as our perspective in life. Then Paul equates everything to our lives. He shows us that we can learn from what he just told us about these, this history and not repeating itself. Verse, eight, verse 11. Now all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Therefore, very powerful verse, therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. In other words, take note of your own well-being. It's not just for Passover. It's for every day of our lives. If we don't consciously think about the way we're living our lives, we are not going to be living our lives the way God wants us to. It's antithesis to human behavior. We have to consciously think about it. We've got to ingrain it in our minds, in our brains, in our thinking, in our actions. We've got to do it so often, so frequently, that it becomes habit for us. And to break that habit would hurt us because we know that it's producing positive things in our lives and the lives of people around us. In other words, take note of our well-being, where we are. Don't drop in the middle of the pool so you can cool off and stop running the hot race. It's easy to do. It was easy for those GIs to do back in World War II. It's one of those things we know where we can drop off into the pool, cool off, and take a break for a while. 
we can walk out and get started all over again. Then Paul encourages us to face the challenges he knows we're going to face in our lives. Verse 13. He said, no temptation has ever has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. The Greek word here translated tempted is the word that is spelled this way in English. It's pirazzo. P-E-I-R-A-Z-O. Pirazzo. It means this. To test. To scrutinize or to discipline. To hearken back to the sermon we heard just last week. God's discipline, God's correcting us. God's putting us back on track. That's the temptation that God says, I'm not going to allow you to be disciplined so much that you get discouraged. I'm not going to beat you to a pulp. I might smack you upside the head with a two-by-four on occasion, and that's going to hurt a little bit. But once I've got your attention, I'll back off. And I'm always going to give you a way to get out of this issue that you're dealing with. I'll help you find the way out. I don't know if you've ever felt this before in your life, but if you haven't and you're young enough, you eventually will. You will run up against something in your life that you will think there's no way out. There's no way of getting around this. That's when God says, I can get you around this. I can make a way of escape for you. Turn back to Psalm 55. Psalm 55. Again, as we learned last week, and for those of you that weren't here, God, out of his deep love for us, corrects us, disciplines us, and rebukes us. But as Paul points out, he knows how much we can handle, and he knows how long he can let it go, and he won't let it go too far. He wants us to win. That's the whole purpose behind anything he does with us in our lives. He wants us to be victorious. He wants us to come out the other end, holding our heads up high, being confident, being encouraged, and moving forward positively. He never promised that we would sail through life with no trauma. What he did promise was that he and Jesus Christ would never abandon us. Under any circumstances would they abandon us. As David points out here for us in Psalm 55, Christ also promised that he would supply everything that we need in life. Let's look at Psalm 55 and begin in verse 22. Psalm 55, 22. David writes this, He said, Cast your burden on the Lord, and he shall sustain you. He shall never permit the righteous to be moved. Now, what does that mean to you when you read that passage of Scripture? Cast your burden on the Lord. It's what we've been talking about here in Sacramento and Reno for the last year or two. Learning to let God handle things in life. God's the one in charge. We're not in charge of our lives. God is. And the minute we relinquish our lives to him, it means not always demanding our way of being things being done, our will being done, letting his will work in us. Let him take us down the path he wants us to go. In the above passage here in, in Psalm 55, 22, Israel had become discouraged. So God had to remind them of just who he was. And that's what happens when we become discouraged. We have to be reminded that no matter how down we get, God can pull us back up out of that. And he can get us back on the positive side of life. God is in control. And those who would place their trust in him would be renewed. Renewed in strength, renewed in faith, renewed in hope. Even when he may be doing this chastening and disciplining to us specifically. He may be correcting us, but he knows he's going to bring us out of that and reshape us to the way he wants us to be for him. Psalm 37, go back just a few pages to your left. Psalm 37. I don't know about you, but there are times... In my life, when my spiritual strength seems to just about fail me. I know that many of you do too, because you have asked for prayers over the years, times for your strength to have the strength to keep standing when life is getting tough. Two things we need to realize in this regard. One, who God is in our personal life 
And two, what he is doing for us right now. I mean, right this very instant you're sitting here listening to this sermon. To us, the trial we may be facing is very personal, and it seems sometimes as though no one else can relate to it or understand it. The fact is that other people have faced and maybe are facing the same thing you are facing. God is teaching us, all of us, that he and he alone is in control and that he is all-powerful. There's nothing he can't fix. There's nothing he can't turn around. God never gets tired. He never grows weary. He's always listening for the prayers of his children because he wants to rush to their aid. That's why David said, I I, I go to Daniel. I mean, they, they prayed to God multiple times a day, not just every day, but multiple times a day. It's interesting, the other day we were driving around picking stuff up, and Jackie was in the car with me. In every store that we went to, there was a parking spot right in front of the door. She said, are you still praying for that? And it's a joke that I've shared with people that I, those are the kinds of prayers I pray all the time. You know, God, it's raining. I need, a, I need a parking place really close. Can you find me a spot? And nine times out of ten, there's a spot right there open for me. And those are the kinds of things that when you do it enough times, it's no longer funny. I mean, I do it all the time. I mean, almost every aspect of my life. Because I, li- I love seeing if God will respond. Now, I don't really personally expect him to respond every single time I ask for a parking place. (laughs) But you know what? It's so many times, it's amazing how many times he does. And it can't be coincidence because it happens almost all the time. Try it in your own life. And this is what God's trying to get us to see and get us to know and understand. You know, develop this personal relationship. Chat with him like you would your best friend. Thank him when he does stuff for you. When you have something really good happen to you, Go up to him and thank him and say, you know, that was so cool. I don't know if you played a role in that, but if you did, thanks. And if you didn't, it was wonderful. You know, it's interesting when we realize that God is in control and he's always in charge of our lives. All of a sudden, this peace starts coming over us. Let's look in Psalms 37 and see David's perspective on challenges of life, whether self-inflicted, and that happens to us, or allowed by God, which happens to us, or maybe even directed by God. It can come from any one of those. Let's begin in Psalm 37 and verse 1. Psalm 37 and verse 1. Do not fret because of evildoers, nor be envious of the workers of iniquity, or people that seem like they're getting away with something. Don't let that bother you. And you know what? That bothers all of us. Some of us, it really, really bothers. When somebody's getting away with something, They're doing something wrong, and they're not getting punished for it. They're hurting somebody because of the way they're wrongdoing. God says, you know, leave it alone. I know that's happening. I can take care of it like that if I choose to. And if it's not getting taken care of, it's because God's not going to take care of it right now for whatever reason. Verse 2, for they, they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. God is in charge, and he will take care of them when the time's right. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. That's an interesting term, isn't it? Feed on his faithfulness. How do you do that? By trusting in him for everything in your life. The more we trust him, the more that faithfulness starts to develop in us and we start having a stronger and stronger relationship. It says in verse 4, Delight yourself also in the Lord and he shall give you the desires of your heart. That's another one of those things where God says, do something and I'll bless you. The Bible's loaded with scriptures like that. There's probably thousands and thousands of descriptors in the Bible where God says, do this and I'll give you the desires of your heart. I'll bless you in every way you can imagine. Commit your way to the Lord, trust also in him and he shall bring it to pass. Then listen to what God is committed to in our lives. Verse 6. He shall bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. People will begin to see you for who and what you really are, a person serving God. And it's going to be like a bright, shining light. Verse 8, cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret. It only causes harm. Don't worry about all this other stuff. Leave it on God's shoulders. Leave it on Jesus Christ's shoulders. They'll take care of it. We get all worked up about this stuff, our stomach gets in a knot, and we get diseases and die. 
What a fun way to live. <laughs> God says, you know, put it on my back. Let me worry about it. You just worry about you. You take care of you. That's a big enough job for you. Drop down to verse 11. Well, let's read verse 9 first. For evildoers shall be cut off, but those who wait on the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. Now verse 11. But the meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. And you can just keep going and going and going here. This is what he wants for all of us in that we deal with it in our lives. He wants us to have peace. He wants us to be content in our lives. He wants us to go to bed at night not worrying about what we're going to do when we get up in the morning. He wants us to get up in the morning not worrying about what we're going to face during the day. Just go forward, move forward. As a reminder, many times we forget what Paul told us in Romans 8, 28. Powerful, powerful scripture. And we know that all things work together for good to them who love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. What will we do with the challenges and trials that we face? Will we drop off the rope halfway across the pool and cool off for the moment? Or will we hang on for dear life knowing that God will get us across that stream? Will we look at life saying, you know what, there's an alligator in that pool. I think I am going to hang on. I'm I'm, I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to quit. We all have our own spiritual alligators as motivators. Everyone's probably got something different. We just need to be reminded of them once in a while and then take them seriously. Realize that God puts stuff out there in our lives to keep us on our toes God will not allow us to fail if we keep our trust and faith in him. Now let's turn to Isaiah 59. Isaiah 59. It's interesting how many times you can read in the Bible how God's going to protect us and he provides for us, and he uses the term similar to wings of eagles. That's how ancient Israel was described coming out of Egypt, on wings of eagles. I'm sure many of us have seen pictures of these big, huge eagles' nests, especially like the bald eagles and golden eagles, high in branches of a tree or a crag of a cliff on a mountaintop way up high. But I'll bet few of us, if any of us, have ever seen the inside of an eagle's nest. When a mother eagle builds her nest for her eggs, she first builds this gigantic bed, and sometimes they're eight, nine, ten feet across. They're enormous, enormous nests. She starts with thorns, really long, picky thorns, broken branches, sharp rocks, and a number of other other items that seem entirely unsuitable for a nest. But then after she gets all of this laid out there, she builds this nest of thick padding of wool and feathers and fur from animals that she's killed. And she makes it soft and really comfortable inside this gigantic nest. Then once the eaglets hatch... And the time they start growing, they start reaching the flying age. The comfort of the nest and the luxury of all these free meals makes it quite reluctant for them to leave the nest. They don't want to jump off that cliff. They don't want to jump out of the nest. So what the mother does is she starts, quote, unquote, stirring up the nest. You've ever heard of that phrase before? It literally happens in the eagle. What she does is she starts tearing away all the padding, all the fluff, all the wool, all the fur, all the, all the soft stuff she rips out of the nest. And she makes it more uncomfortable to stay in the nest. And then she starts nudging them until she eventually just boots them right out of the nest. She gets them out because they're no longer wanting to stay in this nest. This nest becomes less and less uncomfortable for these young eagles. Eventually this and then other urgings prompt the growing eagles to leave their once comfortable home and go out on their own and mature in life and their behavior. Let's look at Isaiah 59. Beginning in verse 1, look at God's perspective on our little nest of life. Psalm, Isaiah 59, verse 1. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor is the ear heavy that it cannot hear. This is encouraging to us, and it should be. God is one of the ones who's not going to quit in the relationship. But then read verse 2 of Isaiah 59. But your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear you. Go back a couple of pages to Isaiah 40. Isaiah 40. Brethren, this Christian walk of ours is a two-way street. God and Jesus Christ will always do their part. They expect us to do our part. Again, we'll see here in Isaiah 40 that they will not be the ones to abandon this relationship that they've built with us. 
Just as that mother eagle, once she creates that nest, never forgets to come back to her nest, Christ said he would never forget to come back and take care of us. He's always going to, he's always going to be there. As the mother eagle is always out gathering and preparing a way for those little eaglets to grow up, so is Jesus Christ, the good shepherd in our lives, gathering, preparing, guiding, teaching, and protecting us, his sheep. Let's look at Isaiah 40 to gain an overall perspective about how God and Jesus Christ work with us continuously. Isaiah 40, verse 28. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak and to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall fall and faint and be weary, and the young man shall fall, utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up like, with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Just as the mother eagle stirs her nest to force her eaglets to get out and grow up, God and Jesus Christ have to stir us up at times to get out and grow up. Maybe mess up our playhouse a little bit once in a while and make us uncomfortable enough to mature, to trust in them, and be more like Jesus Christ. But the end result is fantastic, as we just read in Isaiah 40. So we get ready to close. Let's go over to 2 Corinthians 5. 2 Corinthians 5. The longer I live... the more I realize that everything is in God's hands. When I was younger, I was much more inclined to try and solve everything with my own ability. I was talented, and I knew it. I was smart, and I knew it. And I thought, you know what? I can do this. I can handle this. I can make this work. Now, after many years of trials and tests and troubles... I am just beginning to get a real glimpse of what having real faith is all about. And it's not about me taking care of everything. It's basically not about me taking care of almost anything. And when you think about it, that's what it is for all of us, living by faith. It's a whole new world. It's a world that I don't believe most of us reach until it's too late sometimes to really enjoy life the way God intended us to enjoy life. Letting our spiritual alligator spur us on to do more is a good thing rather than doing less with our lives. To know that God and Jesus Christ are, have always got our best interests at heart. I mean, how can, how can we miss with that? That is like the most profound thing when you really come to understand it. They have our best interest at heart and they want to make sure it happens. Here in 2 Corinthians 5, Paul once again uses the human body as an analogy to a spiritual principle. Let's pick it up in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 1. For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made from hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan earnestly, desiring to be clothed with our habitation which is from heaven. If indeed, having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we, who are in this tent, groan, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed, that morality may be swallowed up by life. This is what our human minds and our human spirit is actually groaning for, more and more of this relationship with God. But we're, when it comes to the physical world, we, we can't seem to relinquish our own physicalness. And in verse 5, he says... Now he has prepared for us this very thing is God. He who has prepared this thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. It's like a, a down payment for us that we can use it to, to tap into this power that he's given us. So we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. In other words, when we're serving ourselves, serving our own way, doing our own will, we're, we're, we're apart from God. For we walk by faith, not by sight. To give yourself a, a shot of that, 
Tonight, tomorrow, sometime, you're in a dark place and there's no lights on. Close your eyes and make sure you can't see anything. And just try walking around. It's hard to do. It's unnerving to do, especially if you're not, if you're not in your own home. If you're in a hotel room or another person's house or something and it's pitch black out, you don't know where the bed is. You don't know where the dresser is. You don't know where the door is. You don't know where the toilet is. You don't know where any of that is. And it's unnerving, isn't it? But then after a while, when you get used to your surroundings, you start making your way around, and you can almost walk in the dark as though your, the lights were all on. I mean, that's why I, I've got my house down pat. I know where everything is, except for Lily, our dog. Sometimes I'm not sure where she is. But this is what Paul's, or Paul's telling us here. He says, you know, when we start walking by faith and not by sight, it, there's a whole comfort that comes over us. It's because we can take on challenges we normally wouldn't have been able to take on. Because we know that if we can't do it, God will. And that is completely reassuring to the human mind once we grasp it. He said, we are confident, yes, well pleased rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or absent from God, to be well pleasing to him. That is is our motivation. That's what makes us get up in the morning. It's not because we have an appointment. It's not because we have to go to a class. It's not because we have to make breakfast. It's not because we have to get the kids off. It's because we want to please God. How many of us, and don't raise your hands, please, how many of you woke up this morning with the number one thought in your mind is pleasing God today? Brethren, you know what? You can make yourself do that. You can remind you, it has to start from just consciously making yourself think like that first. Try it for a few days. Get up out of bed and think, what did, what did Jehorchak tell me to do? Oh, yeah, yeah. I want, to do, I want to do what's pleasing to God today. Remind yourself of that before your feet even hit the floor. I will guarantee you, your perspective on life will change just because you reminded yourself of that simple thought. That should be our constant goal, to be pleasing to God and pleasing to Jesus Christ. We can know that God and Christ will do almost anything necessary to help us to that end. They would love to see us live our lives like that. God's Spirit is our power. Jesus Christ is our leader. He will do whatever it takes to help us grab that rope, run hard, and fling ourselves all the way across that pond of water every day of our lives. The alligator in that pond is different for each and every one of us, but it's there, and God will help us make it to the other side if we just trust in him and try to please him. God knows how to give us the power to overcome anything that's going on in our lives. He will take our weaknesses. He will take our failures, our, our doubts, our fears, and he will turn them into miracles of freedom and strength. Have a wonderful Sabbath.